don't even have to read this before we make good on our bet. You owe me 20 bucks. The joke's on you. Even if I had 20 bucks, what would you spend it on? It's not like there's anything to do around these parts. Don't I know it. Why do you think I've been spending all my time talking to you? I am Doomsvince. And this is day 156 of Spawn Year. Missed opportunities, interesting but underdeveloped characters, lack of forethought, and awkward organization. For one issue that seemed to finally be breaking out of the mold, Curse of the Spawn doesn't miss the chance to fully embrace its trademarks. Alan McElroy seemed to have a real spark of inspiration last issue, but here he's back to going through the motions, pumping out the schlock, and cashing his paycheck. And who can really blame him at this point? McFarlane tied his hands and wouldn't allow him to make this book what the readers were really asking for. More involved stories about spawns throughout history, and then when the book wasn't selling, McFarlane pulled the plug. Who knows at what stage McElroy knew he was getting the boot, but this reads like it's been pulled off life support, and it's lost the will to go on. I still think McElroy could have told smarter and better thought out tales with what he had, but especially toward the end, with that one exception, there's a who gives a crap attitude that hangs like a thick film over his work. While the introduction of Mark Simmons was inspired, finally giving us a real glimpse into Al's immediate family that reveals possible clues about his worldview and his life goals, this issue sloppily switches gears. It's like suddenly taking an exit on the highway I wasn't expecting. Mark isn't just feeling remorseful over patience he's lost in Al's death, but now for the murders of his wife and son. All we're told is he's the fed someone wanted to hurt. I guess he's a psychiatrist who works for the government and someone had a vendetta against him for no reason were ever given. Why wasn't this set up in the, you know, setup issue? I assume last issue was there to establish his character and situation for the crocodile killer so the story could really move forward this issue, but all of a sudden, Sam and Twitch are nowhere to be seen, Mark's motivated by a different tragic backstory altogether, and the hallucinations are gone. If he blames himself for the deaths of his wife and child, it's hard to believe that the death of his brother, who everyone thinks was killed in the line of duty, would be weighing more heavily on his mind. He could certainly, unrealistically, be torturing himself over both events, but it seems like a surefire bet this was an afterthought, especially as shoehorned in and underdeveloped as it is. And check out the structure of these issues. Yesterday it was to be concluded. Here it's the end. All right, makes sense. Except the cover doesn't think this is the end of a story arc, it thinks it's the beginning of one. Return of Suture, Part 1. So it's the end of Mark's story by way of reintroducing Suture. That's okay, I guess, but it's a pretty awkward way to tell a story. Why was it conceived like this? I actually like Suture, and I was excited to see her return, but her character, from its inception, seems a little one-note. She's a serial killer who kills serial killers, fueled by rage because of what was done to her by a system that allows killers to walk free. Wouldn't it be more interesting to follow Mark and see Suture through the eyes of a psychiatrist, make him our straight man exploring the violent, hellish underbelly of the city, even discovering the world his brother Al now dwells in and is consumed by. Instead, he's another damaged man whose life is ruined by ties to the government, which is starting to get old. And while those parallels to Al's destruction might be worth exploring, they're not explored and so it feels like rehash. An FBI profiler Mark once looked up to, Foster, is obsessively looking for Suture. All this research into serial killers seems to have driven him nuts. He's in love with Suture, and that's why he wants to find her so bad. He bribes Mark into helping him, claiming to know who murdered his family, which he does at gunpoint. That's a little over the top. So they follow the crocodile killer, she shows up, Foster gets killed professing his undying love for her, Mark never finds out who the killer of his family was, and he fears he's become just like Foster because of his own obsession. I hope Mark is still our central character into the next issue, but I'm not hopeful. And if he is, how is this the end? This one really defeats the purpose of the last, and supplants it with something I found infinitely less interesting. Ah oh well, at least I won that bet with Violator. Signed, Captain Logan.